He did what? Under pressure and he's sacked by Kyle O'Mac. Holy cow, what a catch. Patriots win the Super Bowl. Brady has his fifth. Hello and welcome to NFL Talk UK. It's the second episode, we made it to number two. We did. That's pretty good. I'm Tom Julian, this is Ben McClymont, and I am so pleased to say that we have been joined by the man, the myth, the legend. It's Coach Jeff Reinbold. Jeff. Hi Jeff. How are you? How are you guys doing? We're very, very good here, Jeff. So. We, we talked a little bit about it on uh, last week's show. We tried to get Jeff on. We actually did have him did on. Have on yeah. uh, but technology beat us in week one, it's fair to say, Jeff. But we can see you. You're in, you're in beautiful high definition. And we're launching this new project. We're getting the fans involved. We want you guys to be the leaders in this. But Jeff, you've always been passionate about, about the UK fan base, about um, ex ex exposing us to more NFL year on year, and it's happening now. You're a real leader in that, and I'm so glad that you're involved in this project as well. Well, you know what, Tom, you and I talked about this numbers of times when we were working together at Sky, that you know, there's so much of an appetite now for the NFL in the UK and all over the world, basically, but particularly we're talking about the UK, and the fan base has become so knowledgeable there, but there's no place for them to go and exchange ideas, exchange thoughts, exchange takes. What's up with my team? You know, why did they play this? Why did they do that? So hopefully we're going to fill that void, and I think it's going to be an awful lot of fun. Absolutely. And as you can see already on Twitter, um, we, we've expanded loads. So thank you to the guys that have already thank started you. following us. Um, if you could subscribe to the YouTube channel, which will be in a lot of links, uh, that'd be really appreciated <laughs> as well. And we're going to keep bringing you content. And Jeff, when you're over as well, it's only going to get bigger and better. We want to take it to uh, local teams. We want to have tweet ups. We want to hang out pretty much all the time. Does that sound good to you? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's what it's all about, about the interaction with the fan, the, the ability to touch the fan. Because the one thing that's difficult with NFL fans, particularly in the UK, is they don't have a tangible point to go to reach their NFL. We're hoping to take this thing around the UK and, and meet the fans, interact with the fans, because the fans are what drive the game. It's, it's not about the players, frankly. It's not about my coaches. It's not about my owners. It's about the fans that care, care so deeply, deeply about, about their team. team. Yeah, definitely. I think we've seen that first week. We've only been going one week, but the interaction we've had even after week one has been great. So thanks for all the shout outs and everything. And Jeff's been tweeting us about it all the time, which is great. So we've got a lot of good interaction, which we can, we can build on. We have, and we finally have some NFL to talk about. So hey. let's, uh, let's stop wasting this time and, and let's talk about it, Jeff. So from, from the first, very first game, Thursday night football, we had a massive shock, there's no doubt about it. Patriots 27, Chiefs 42 in Gillette Stadium. The Chiefs blew them out. And Jeff, nobody saw that coming, apart from this guy, Ben McClymon, who predicted that Chiefs were going to be massive this year. Jeff, how did you well, see that game? Well, I don't know. You got Nostradamus sitting next to you. <laughs> I'm going to say it. There's very few people in the football community, particularly, that would have ever given the Chiefs... I mean, you could see the Chiefs winning the game, right? I mean... That's the reality of the NFL any given Sunday. But to go into Foxborough on a night where they unveil their fifth championship banner, opening game, all of the things that make New England so tough to beat, and then to go in there and beat them. And, Tom, not just beat them. They beat them soundly. They took them out behind the woodshed and beat them until <laughs> they liked them, kind of beat them. And, you know, you look at that Kansas City Chief team, and I think it's a, it's about time that we all stop labeling Alex Smith as a quarterback who manages games. He hit deep balls. He, you know, he's got a lot of weapons at his, at his disposal right now. And I think what fans maybe and all of us in the media, or most of us in the media, mistook a couple years ago when they didn't throw the ball down the field. They didn't have down the field type receivers. Now, you know, you look at what they've got outside and. And uh, Tariq Hill is, a, I mean, he's scary. He, he beat them in quarters coverage. He got on top of them so fast. I mean, he's one of the fastest players to ever have played in the National Football League. You got Travis Kelsey at tight end. And, you know, the, the young rookie tailback out of Toledo, who two, year, two weeks ago was a backup, comes in and sets an NFL record after he fumbles his first touch <laughs> of the ball. So it was just an amazing effort by the Chiefs. 
Yeah, and the great thing about that, that Kareem Hunt's debut, you know, the, the best rookie debut ever for a running back. And, and you said it yourself there, Jeff, he'd never even fumbled at college, you know, and then his first, his first moment in the NFL, you know, he's been dreaming about this forever and, and he fumbles the ball. But his mental resolve there to get back up yeah. and go, do you know what? I'm not going to let that stop me tonight. And, and then to have a day yeah. like he did, that's just, just incredible. Because he looked quite calm at first. He was, he was down, and Alex Smith and a few people went round him, and it could really have gone either way, but he really bounced back, didn't he? As a coach, Jeff, you kind of, that, that, that's where you make your money, right? You have to put your arm around some players, you have to shout at some players, you really have to know. And it must be hard with these rookies coming in to gauge what they need at that point. Well, that's a great point, Tom, because they haven't gone. There's no, there's no history there. There's no track record there. Right? This kid faces adversity in his first carry as an NFL player, and, and you don't have years of working with that athlete and understanding his psychology. It was interesting. Ben made a great point. That when you watched it on the sideline, he didn't want anybody to talk to him. He wanted to, go, he wanted to flush it himself. And what I think the Chiefs did a great job was – getting the ball back in his hands and showing confidence in him right away. And I think that's really, really good coaching by Andy Reid and that offensive staff. You got a guy who made a mistake. He knows he made a mistake. Don't shy away from him. Give him the ball again because you're going to need him over the course of the game. And he really responded well. Absolutely. Well, the Chiefs wasn't the only shock we saw, was it, Ben, this weekend? You know, you could, you could name a bunch. The, the Jags, the J J Jeff, the Jags have a winning record for the first time <laughs> since week one of the 2011 season. That's crazy, isn't that is it? That is crazy, yeah. Um, and 10 sacks, a franchise record. That was a huge, huge performance for the Jags, D, who have been promising to do that for a while. Well, you know what? In the offseason, they went out and got players camp. And, you know... Free agency, Tommy, as we talked about a bunch of times, it is kind of a crapshoot a little bit. You tend to overpay when you go out and get free agents, especially veteran free agents. And, you know, they went out and went after Calais Campbell. And really, Calais' best football is probably behind him. But he's a great locker room guy. He's a great leader. And Sunday, he set the all-time Jack single game sack record in the first Yeah, half. yeah it's crazy. Which was unbelievable. I mean, you know, Bill O'Brien was so frustrated. Savage was under duress every time he went back and through. They went to Deshaun Watson just so they had a guy who might be able to get away from all that pressure. Yeah, definitely. So, but we're getting excited about the defense, but can we get excited about the Jags offense? Yeah, obviously, Robinson looks like he's out now. Fournette did have a game, but there's a few missing pieces there, isn't there? Blake Bortles, you know, the most important guy. We've got to be patient. We've got to understand what the Jags are. Yeah. The Jags are going to win with that defense. They've drafted well defensively in the last three or four years. Now you see Fowler playing. You see, you know, evidence of what they've done in the draft. They're playing a different style of defense than they played under, under Gus. They're more aggressive. They're more in your face. I think that suits them. They run extremely well. They just got to do enough on offense to win games. The you know, 18-16, 21-14. Those are the kind of games they're going to have to win over the course of the season. That's their that's their formula for success because of the fact they miss Robinson now, and you don't want to put too much on Blake Bortles. Yeah. One more question I wanted to ask you, Jeff, about uh, about the Savage Deshaun Watson situation. You know, that's a young quarterback room to pull. Savage so early into week one, you know, that's that's starting to be a bit of a Bill O'Brien trait, isn't yeah, it? To, to, to yank a quarterback. But how does that how does that quarterback room feel? Are they mature enough to kind of recover from that? Deshaun Watson's now got a really tough road ahead of him, especially on Thursday well, night. Well, yeah, now it's on the coaching. Now it really comes down to the coaching and the leadership on that football team. The veteran leadership, Hopkins, JJ Watt. All of those guys, they've got to band together because this is now where, you know, your coaching will, will work in the room. That quarterback room, that's that's an interesting dynamic. But now it's what do you get done with your veterans? How do your veterans approach this thing and how do they how do they help you right this ship? Because we're talking about a team that had Super Bowl aspirations on defense and just got I mean, they got blistered. That was not a good game by any stretch by Houston. 
Mm. Yeah, we, we talked about one great defensive performance. Let's talk about one more, Jeff. The Baltimore Ravens shut out the Cincinnati Bengals. You know, Andy Dalton did not have a nice time of it. But, but he was put under so much pressure. And I saw you tweeting earlier. That Baltimore defense maybe didn't get enough credit for the, for the job it's done. And, and they are some unit. They are a filthy bunch right there. <laughs> they, they are nasty. And, you know, you look at Cincinnati and my takeaway from the Cincinnati game was, Tommy, I remember two years ago in the playoffs looking at the Bengals and saying they might have the best roster in the NFL top to bottom. Yeah. Well, that's really changed now. Ray Malaluga's moved on. Two big tackles moved on. You know, the offensive line's been dismantled. They've lost players. Just not just players, Reggie Nelson. You talk about impact guy, and they haven't replaced them. And you see, you, you saw that. Andy Dalton is not the kind of quarterback that can play that kind of football. He needs a running game. He needs an offense, an offensive line behind him. Uh, you know, Green's still a great receiver, but you know, I'm worried for the Bengals. That was not any. That was a really poor display. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. But I think, in a way, it's a good matchup now, isn't it? There's two teams who got blown away first week who are coming together. How's that going to work out? Who are you talking about? Talking about the Texans and the Bengals. Oh, on Thursday night? Yeah, Thursday night football. Yeah, I mean, you've, you've not got a lot of time to recover. Is, no. that, a, is that a good thing when, you, when you've had a terrible first game? You don't want a lot of time, or do you need it? I think it's the best thing, because right. what you do now is you don't even look at that tape. You flush that as quick as you can. You may look at a few things. But you go right on now into the next week, and, and it gives the players the worst thing about the National Football League, or one of the worst things about pro football, guys, is the fact that it's not like soccer where you play another game in three days or baseball where you play another game tomorrow or basketball tomorrow. In football, you got to wait seven days to get the stink of losing off of you. And this opportunity to play on Thursday is good for both these teams. Yeah, absolutely. Now, um Lots of people getting lots of uh, excitement, Ben included, getting very excited about uh, the LA Rams, putting up 46 points. You know, you, you, we, we talked about that with James Simpson, our fantasy expert, and we will get to our fantasy stuff a little bit later on. Um, I mean, they smashed the Colts. Is that more on the Colts, Jeff, than the, than the Rams, or are the Rams a real deal? Are they, are they on the turn now? Well, let's, let's, let's pump, the, pump the brakes a little bit on <laughs> the real deal kind of talk. I think... The reality is yet to show when they start playing against better competition. The Colts were seriously overmatched, particularly at the quarterback position. I thought that Wade Phillips did an outstanding job of putting a game plan together that made it tough on Colvin. They're going to get Aaron Donald back now, which is really going to help them, I think, too. You know, that Tanzel Smart, that six-round kid out of Tulane, played really well for him. The, the thing to me with the Rams is going to be just – how good is golf? And we got to see them win a game from the pocket, in my opinion. Mm-hmm. They did a great job, McVay, all credit to him. They did a great job of moving him around, play action, you know, doing enough. Uh, Cooper Cup, I think, is a good young receiver. But I want to see that kid when he's down by five and he's got to drive him for a touchdown from the pocket late in the game. When he does that, then I'm going to say, I'm buying in now. Yeah, definitely. He's got a lot to prove with him. But how, how are we feeling about Sammy Watkins now? Like, there's a proper receiver there. If he stays fit, then that surely gives him a better out than he's had in the past few years. So maybe that gives him a bit more, more confidence to, to maybe go through those four quarters. Yeah, you know, Sammy Watkins is a big play guy now. He can do an awful lot for you. He can do a lot for you running through people and, you know, blowing the top off the coverage. And he can do a lot for you catching the little short screens and making people miss. And then, you know, Cup, like I said, Cup, I think, is a guy that is going to show out to be a really solid NFL receiver. I don't know if he'll ever be a number one, but I think he, when you pair him with Watkins, that's a nice little mix there. I was impressed with the running back, not only just running the football, but catching the football. And, you know, he, he's, uh, he's a reckless runner, you know. And so I think there's some real good things going on in Los Angeles. But, again... Let's pump the brakes a little bit until they get against a little better competition. Yeah. I tried to tell that to Ben no. Jeff earlier. He was, uh, oh yeah, no. Ram, Rams for the Super Bowl. Hey, Benny, Bowl. let me ask you, man. I got to ask you this. You're a Rams fan. No, I'm not a Rams fan. Tom's bigging me up here. <laughs> I, me and James were having a chat. Okay. And we were... What did you think of the new uni? The what, sorry? What did you think of the new uniform? Well, the Rams. I loved them. That was, you know what? I looked at it on TV, and if they can just get rid of that little bit of gold in the sleeve, yeah, I'm thinking, 
Roman Gabriel, the fearsome foursome. You know, I, I mean, see, that, that was that was back in the in the day, man. I was going to say that to you, Jeff. I love it when when they go for the retro uniforms and they just they just bring it back, especially the Rams, who have so much history yeah, in exactly. LA from first time round. It just feels right to kind of go back to that, doesn't it? Yeah, it really does. And I, you know, again. They're going to have to. They've got some work to do. That stadium was about half full, and again, you got to understand that's a huge stadium, hundred thousand people. But Tommy, they got some work to do to to kind of create a fan base again because LA is such a tough market, and it's a college football town. It's got UCLA, it's got USC, yeah. and you know it's going to take them a minute, and and they're going to have to win. That's you know LA is a, is about winning, yeah, and absolutely. it's about winning a certain way, winning with style, winning with you know, a little pizzazz. One of the reasons Goff got picked, frankly, is he's a California kid and he looks the part. Yeah. Now, if he can put some wins together with his good looks, watch out, LA. <laughs> he's going to print money. Well, let's go from one team that started off brilliantly to the other side of that team, the Indianapolis Colts. And Jeff, to me, they look in serious trouble. Not even There's no even timetable for Andrew Luck to return. You know, they're missing Ryan Kelly. They're missing some serious players. Yeah, you know what? Uh, that's a tough one for me because Chris Ballard's a friend of mine, GM. I've known Chris since he was an area scout. Texas guy, great guy, great guy, good football guy. Yeah. But he, you know, he took on a, he's taken on, he's taken on a chore in, in Indianapolis. But they, uh, you know, he, he wasn't left much by the previous regime, and it's, a, you know, a situation where he's got to overhaul a roster, and that takes time. It's a, to me, the Colts are a three-year project, and the tough part about it is, you know, you know, you got a franchise quarterback. But do you want to put him out there right now until he's 100% healthy with that supporting cast? Because he's only, he's been beaten up too much in his career already. And frankly, for me, I would hold him until I know he's 100% healthy. And, you know, you're going to have to swallow hard and realize that you know, you're going to get a better draft pick, I guess, is the way you look at it. Yeah, I mean, you, you talked about Chris Ballard there, and, and there was a lot of people who are the during the draft and in free agency, they said, this guy's done an amazing job to strengthen Indianapolis's defense, which was just so porous last year. And, and now you're having these offensive struggles. You've got to feel for, for a general manager like that coming into a program where you think he's done everything right. You know, he's put his stock in, in improving the defense. And then the offense without Andrew Luck and, and Ryan Kelly, who's, who really shouldn't be underestimated how important he is to that team. Um, the offensive line falls apart, and you put Scott Tolzien, you put Jacoby Brissett. It's going to be the same result, don't you think? Yeah, you know what? You don't get a job in the NFL as a general manager or the head coach because typically because you're going into a good situation. You get a job because the guy before you screwed it up, yeah. basically, and now he's got to make up for it. Tom, I can't emphasize, and Benny, I can't emphasize to the listeners and the viewers how important the draft is because one bad draft sets you back years and now you have multiple bad drafts where you're playing, the guys you drafted don't turn out. Then you're looking at a long, long process to restock your roster. Yeah, definitely. I think they might they might feel the pain of that for a few a few weeks, especially and probably a few years after this. But I think it's a good point about uh, Andrew Luck as whether you just made him sit him out until he's fully fit. That's, what are you going to gain now? There's not there doesn't seem a lot to gain. I know it's only week one, but he's I think he's in a, a losing battle. Well, I, yeah, it's not even a case of do you sit him out. They then generally don't seem to know when, yeah. when he's coming back. And, and that kind of uncertainty is not good for the team, it's not good for the fan base, and it's certainly not good for the general manager and head coach who are going to feel the pressure uh, in not too long. Uh, it's a, yeah, it's a dangerous, dangerous game for all involved. Um, let's look ahead to some, some week two fixtures then, Jeff. We've got, some, we've got some great ones, actually. Sky Sports have picked a couple of doozies on Sunday night. You've got the New England Patriots at New Orleans Saints and then the Dallas Cowboys at Denver Broncos. They're your 6 and 9 p.m. games in the UK. And they are four, four exciting-looking teams. I know the Saints, uh, well, they... You you had a you had a couple of hot takes last night, didn't you, Jeff, about the Saints? Yeah, you know, uh, it's interesting. You know, you look at that football team, and 
you know, golly, you know, Drew Brees seems to have to do too much all the time. I mean, he made throws just, I mean, he put some throws in there in tiny, tiny windows. But their defense, which looked better in preseason, didn't look well, didn't look very good against the Minnesota offense that had a lot of questions going into that game. They've rebuilt their offensive line. Dalvin Cook came out and rushed for, I don't know, 128 or 130 in the game. Uh, Adam Thielen, Adam Thielen, an undrafted free agent, has nine catches against you. And, you know, a fifth rounder in Stephon Diggs has two touchdowns against you. So there's still a lot of work that needs to get done in New Orleans. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely, because uh, Cook ripped him up on the ground as well. It wasn't like they could stop him from the air or the ground. They just couldn't stop him at all. So there's definitely some holes there. And when you come up against a Patriots team that's hurting, I th- I'm predicting bad things for the uh, Saints this week. Hey, hey, Benny, let me ask you a question. Do you, yeah. think the, do you think the guy in the hood was a little tough to be around on Monday and Tuesday of this week? <laughs> yeah, I think you might have been. I, I'm going to tell you something. I would have loved to have been there this week just to see how he handled that situation. And, and you know that giving up 45 points and almost 500 yards of offense or 450 or whatever it was of offense, that's got to grind against him more than anything in the world because he's a defensive guy. You know, he made his name as a defensive coordinator. And, you know, Coach Patricia, he's got to feel the same way. That They will come out, and I think you'll see a completely different Patriot team. If you're, uh, if you're brand new to the NFL, Jeff's referring to head co- Patriots head coach Bill Belichick, who almost looks like one of the uh, Star Wars characters at times <laughs> with, his, with his big hood and, his, uh, his, and he, he will not be happy with that. But the, the stats that's kicking around at the moment, Jeff, you know, Tom Brady's lost three openers, Your uh, favorite status, three it? season openers, and every year he's won the Super Bowl. So... Uh, Probably best not to write off the Patriots uh, just yet. Um, and the Dallas Cowboys at Denver Broncos both started 1-0. and You know, you've got Ezekiel Elliott back. We don't know how long that, that kind of, uh, that, that wrangle is going to go on for. The fact that will he, won't he be banned. But for now, Ezekiel Elliott, he put up 100 yards on Sunday. And he's going to look to do that again against the Broncos, right? Yeah, you know what? These two teams both want to play the same style of football, if you look at them, right? They want to play complementary football. When we talk about complementary football, what we're talking about is the defense, the offense, and the special teams all play together to create wins. Now, you look at the Cowboys and the statistic, guys, that just, I mean, I couldn't believe it at halftime. They had run 45 offensive plays in the first half. 45. They had more offensive plays than the Giants had passing yards. So I, I, that's phenomenal. And what that does is that keeps your defense rested and off the field. And now when they go out to play, they're fresh. You could see the giant defense in the second half. They were just tired. They, they had played so the normal NFL game, guys, you play 64 plays of offensive defense. The Cowboys had 45 at halftime. Now, factor in again the fact that in preseason, you don't play a full game as a player. And there's nothing that gets you in shape to play like playing football. Yeah. So that, that giant defense was completely gapped in the second half. Give Rod Marinelli credit for an amazing job with a bunch of no-name guys on defense. I mean, really. They got Sean Lee, they got Orlando Skandrick, and that's really about the names that you got on defense. And they played incredible defensive football. Absolutely. So we've, we've talked about the uh, Patriots, Saints, Dallas Cowboys, Denver Broncos game. Uh, those two are on Sky, as I said. Ben, if you have a look down the list there, if you're, if you're a Game Pass, Game of the Week kind of guy, which game are you looking out for most? For me, I'm looking forward to Viking Steelers. I think that's a good, a good matchup. I think the Steelers just scraped through against the Browns, but they provide a bit of flash there. Brown looked good. Bell was nowhere to go, which kind of just did predict that first week as well. Mm-hmm. I think he'll come back with a bang. But Vikings were ruthlessly efficient. They, they spread it around. Dan Cook was good, and defense was good as well. I think that's going to be a real good matchup. It might not be a lot of points, but I think it's going to be a great, a really tight game. Hey, hey Benny, if you want to watch that game, you better get some ice bags because the fans watching the game might be bruised because <laughs> that's going to be such a physical physical game. Yeah, it's I'm going to tell you something. Good. Those two teams will hit each other. <laughs> you know that you got Zimmer, who 
you know, loves physical football, and that's the Steelers' mantra. They're at home. I'm, I'm going to tell you something. Seriously, this game, yeah, I'm going to call it the Bruise Bowl because there, there are going to be some hitting going on yeah. in Pittsburgh. One game I'm looking forward to, Jeff, uh, is, is two kind of prove-it teams, I think, for me. We've got the Philadelphia Eagles visiting the Kansas City Chiefs. Um, obviously, the Chiefs now have, have put a bit of a mark on their back, haven't they? They've, yeah. they've gone out and they've, they've, they've slayed the Patriots first week. And, and the Philadelphia Eagles, you've got Wentz, uh, you've got this young upstart. He had a really good start. Uh, if you remember last year, I think it went three or four and zero, and then it all kind of fell apart for them. So I'd like to see them do it against a really, really good and up for a Kansas Chief, uh, City Chiefs uh, team. I think that's going to be a fast, furious, and exciting game. I think it's going to be a great football game, and I think that I think the Eagles are better than people think they are right now. I think particularly on defense, their defensive front can get after you. Uh, they're much better up front than the Patriots are right now in the front seven. I think they've got enough guys in the back end that they can cover. I like what Jim Schwartz does on defense. I think that Kansas City's going back to Kansas City, and everybody in the on the plaza, everybody in KC, everybody in the barbecue shops, everybody in the barbershop, every place these players go, everybody's telling them how great they are and how you just beat the Patriots. So there's a tremendous opportunity for Kansas City to become – victims of an epidemic of the success flu. And so they got to, Andy Reid's got to inoculate them really quickly early in the week and say, guys, what you did was fantastic, but we have got to get on to Philadelphia because this is a good football team coming into Arrowhead. Yeah, definitely. We heard a few Chiefs fans on Twitter actually saying that Eric Berry missing is huge. So with, oh, no. with the hype. Hey, you're right, Benny. There, no question. You don't replace a guy like no. that. Now, wasn't it amazing the job he did on Gronk? Yeah, and, you know so what he held Gronk to like three catches, I think, over the course of the yeah. game. It was, it was. I never seen anybody, linebacker, DB, whatever, match up against Gronkowski and run with him. Not only run with him stride for stride, but push and shove with him because Gronk's a big physical man. I thought, I thought Barry was outstanding in the game, and certainly he's going to be missed. Yeah, definitely the big fourth down stop as well against the run. So I think that's that's a bit of an issue. But like we were saying before, I do like them on offense, and I think that. There's, there's still, that's a, that's a good matchup. Absolutely. Jeff, I, I could talk to you all night, um, and I, I'm sure you'd say, Tom, let me go, I've got plans. Jeff's one of the busiest men I know, I swear he's talking to somebody all the time. So we will let you go, but Jeff, before you do go, I've got a list of injuries here. I want you to tell me who is the most important to their team, which one is going to be the biggest, uh, this biggest missing at least for week two and maybe maybe uh, further on. So you've got David Johnson, who's dislocated his wrist. They say he'll be out for two to three months. Alan Robinson for the Jags. Um, he's out for the season. Reuben Foster uh, picked up a high ankle sprain. He's going to be massive for the, for the 49ers. And Ronald Darby, uh, the Eagles cornerback that they traded uh, for this, this summer, he's dislocated his ankle, so he'll be out for at least three to four weeks, you would have thought. David Johnson, Alan Robinson, Ruben Foster, Ronald Darby. Jeff, who is the biggest loss there? Well, you know, to me, the biggest loss might be Robinson. And the reason I say that, Tommy, is they don't really have other guys that can pick up the slack. There's nobody on that roster, when you look at those receivers, that you say, okay, now he's going to function as the number one. Obviously, Dave Johnson is a, David Johnson is a huge loss to the Cardinals because he can do so much not only from the backfield running the football, but also, you know, playing in the slot, playing wide. You know, I think Bruce has done a great job of taking advantage of that kid's unique skill set. But when you when you evaluate it to me, I just think that Robinson brings so much, particularly in the red zone for J for Jacksonville. I think that's one that's really going to hurt the Jags. Absolutely. That's I, uh, well, I couldn't agree more as a, as a Jags fan <laughs> that there's nobody left for, for balls to throw it to. I think he's now, I mean, Leonard Fournette was their third highest receiver on Sunday, you know, a rookie running back, and you need another option in that team if they're going to really push on. They've got the Titans this weekend. That's another massive divisional game. If, of course, it happens um, after Hurricane Irma, we're, we're still waiting to see the, the outcome of that, and we're, we're just hoping that everybody is okay there. Hey. <laughs> Jeff, Jeff, Jeff's got a little bit of <laughs> Jeff, introduce your dog to everybody. Guys, she needs to eat. She says, come on, enough of this football talk. i got to get some food in there. 
<laughs> and with that, Jeff, we're going to let you go. Thank you so much for joining us. We really appreciate it. And hopefully we'll get to speak to you again next week. All right, fellas. You take care. You too. <laughs> See you, Jeff. Cheers, Jeff. Thank you so much to Jeff for joining us. We always appreciate his views. As a coach, he just knows so much. He does know a lot, doesn't he? Yeah, it's so good having him around. Yeah, he's, you, you, I think you've said it before. He's intimidating because he's just this fountain it's of a wealth. Yeah, a wealth of knowledge. Um, we're going to get him involved more and more. But let us know in the comments section what you thought of, of what he's got to say. You know, Are you back in the Rams now? Are you still, uh, still holding off a little bit? You know, There's so much to talk about from week one, so get involved in the comments. Also, get in touch with us on Twitter nfl underscore talk underscore uk uh, get chatting to us we'd love to have your nfl insta reactions after each game as well so if you want to be involved with that please just reach out the more the merrier we're excited to get you involved now we talked about it a little bit earlier we had our fantasy man james simpson last week he nailed a couple of his picks and i'm sure he's got some more exciting stuff for us now james simpson take it away Week one is in the books. Let's round up last week's waiver wire selections and start sits and then look ahead to week two. I think the biggest thing to focus on this week was just the whole unpredictability of week one. We build up for so long to this week and then suddenly things happen that we can't predict and everything can change. There's obviously been a massive amount of injuries and a lot of things we didn't expect. So we're just going to have to kind of adapt to that moving forward. On the waiver wire, we weren't so successful last week with Chris Carson. Wendell Smallwood, Ted Ginn and Paul Richardson. All of them had a little bit of an impact but not as much as we'd have hoped to be able to start them. I'd say with the Seahawks I think they're going to be on the way up so those two players should be involved moving forward. Chris Carson actually got the most carries out of the backfield. They just didn't go for very many yards. Uh, Ted Ginn looked like a target for the Saints but again they struggled and Wendell Smallwood didn't have a big enough impact at all. In terms of the start sits I think we absolutely nailed it. Start all your Vikings. Stefan Diggs had a huge game. Sam Bradford had a great day. Dalvin Cook, Adam Thielen, all great fantasy starters and then the Rams as well. Rams defense was obviously outstanding. Todd Gurley did enough to be a fantasy starter. He didn't look great actually on the field, but his fantasy performance was awesome. And even Jared Goff, I wasn't entirely confident in. He put up some good numbers and played a nice clean game of football. The biggest path to waiver wire success, at least early in the season, is just accounting for injuries. We don't know the David Johnson news completely yet, but if he misses an extended amount of time, we're going to need to find his replacement because at least in terms of volume, he's going to be worth plugging into your lineups. Alan Robinson's out, Danny Woodhead might be out for a lengthy time. All of these things are things that we need to take into account when we're moving forward and using our waiver wire budget. So let's talk about the waiver wire. I think the first person you're going to want to target this week is Tariq Cohen, uh, running back from the Chicago Bears. Obviously Jordan Howard is an early down starter for Chicago, but they will be playing from behind in quite a lot of their games. Tariq Cohen had a huge game with 113 total yards. He saw 12 targets out of the backfield, which is insane. But for a team that will be playing catch-up a lot of the time, a weapon like him will probably be involved quite a lot. Second is Kenny Golladay, wide receiver from the Detroit Lions. We heard about it all through preseason. This is Baby Tron. This is the next big thing. He opened up the preseason with two huge touchdown catches, and then he's opened up the regular season with the same thing. This is based on a huge performance and the fact that Matthew Stafford looks like he's hot. And you'll want as many pieces as you can get of this Lions offense. Another couple of receivers I really like based on performances in the first week are Cooper Cup and Nelson Aguilar. With Cup, we kind of saw it in the preseason that him and Jared Goff had developed a bit of a rapport. But it came into fruition in the first game. Cup looks like a great PPR option, a possession type receiver. And if he's Goff's go-to guy, that would be a great for fantasy owners moving forward. We all know about the struggles Aguilar had last season. I think he still may struggle with the odd drop here and there, but it looks like the team's really desperate to get him involved. They used him down the field, they used him on end arounds, wide receiver screens, swing passes, everything they could do to set him up. He almost scored a second touchdown as well. We don't really know how the offense is going to look at the moment, but it looks like he's going to be a big feature. And then the other two are a couple of running backs based on injuries. With David Johnson going down, we have to think that Kerwin Williams will be the first man up. I would definitely expect the team to sign a veteran or trade for a veteran at this point. But Kerwin Williams should be a player who you pick up because he knows the offense and he might be plugged straight in from next week. When Danny Woodhead went down in Baltimore, Javorius Allen saw 19 carries compared to Terrence West who had 21. That's pretty good involvement. I know the 
Baltimore Ravens aren't going to be up by this much or running the ball 40 times a game every game. But they don't really want to put the ball in the hands of Joe Flacco, so they will be a run-heavy team. Buck Allen could be a good pickup and just a flex play at this point. And we have a few juicy starts this week, including Amari Cooper against the New York Jets. Cooper had a series in week one where he was targeted three times at the goal line. He did manage to score a touchdown on the day, but he could have had a lot more. And it looks like Derek Carr is finally, finally going to start pushing the ball his way more than Michael Crabtree. And we'll start to see an Amari Cooper breakout. Against the Jets, I expect the Raiders to score a lot of points. So you want to make sure he's in your team. Next, the Brandon Cooks revenge game. The Patriots are facing the Saints, who just give up a ton of yards and touchdowns all the time through the air. You'll want to have Cooks in your team. There aren't too many other options in New England at the moment. Rob Gronkowski will see a fair share, but Brandon Cooks in a dome, I expect him to put up a lot of points. And then we've got Ty Montgomery, someone who I was a little wary of coming into the season, but his usage was great in week one. If he can do what he did against Seattle, then he can definitely do it against Atlanta. This is a team that gave up a ton of yards to Tariq Cohen out the backfield. Green Bay could use him in exactly the same role on receptions, get the ball in his hands. And he could put up a few yards in Atlanta in what I expect to be a very high-scoring game. And then there are a few sits. The Jacksonville defense was outstanding in week one. They were playing against Tom Savage and the Houston Texans, who aren't exactly the most glamorous of offenses. But they had 10 sacks. They absolutely destroyed the offensive line in Houston. And I'm a little worried about the Titans so far. Mariota doesn't seem like he's been in too much of a rhythm this pre-season or the start of the season it's time to sit Mariota sit DeMarco Murray and kind of see what happens from here I'm not sure they'll be able to put up a ton of points against a strong Jacksonville defense and the other sits are a couple of running backs who were sort of in the mid-tier of running back twos running back threes you could play them some weeks you might want to sit them some weeks this week you will want to sit both Carlos Hyde and Isaiah Crowell Hyde is facing the Seahawks defense. No doubt they're going to be pretty ticked off about that loss to Green Bay. And I think they're going to come flying against the 49ers and dominate in that game. And Crowell only managed 33 yards on the ground against the Steelers. Now he's facing the Ravens, who will have one of the best defenses in football. It's going to be a struggle for Cleveland to put too many points on the board this week. Hope that was helpful. And as always, you can hit us up on NFL underscore talk underscore UK on Twitter. I'm at JS underscore football and good luck this week and speak to you next week. Thank you very much, James. Some good shouts there. And I think um, one man who everyone is after is uh, Tariq Cohen. And I know this man here, number one in the wave wire in our league, is after him. So uh, what, what's your views on Cohen? Yeah, I mean, I had a terrible week one. I'm not going to lie to you. I, very, very disappointing. Loss? Uh, yes. Oh. Yeah, massively. Um, my best scorer was uh, DeAndre Hopkins with about 12. Mm. Um, no performances anywhere from Wilson. Obviously, I had JJ missing. Melvin Gordon didn't add too many points. Um, so very disappointing. Tariq Cohen's going to come in because uh, I'm first on the wave wire, so I know I'm going to nail it. Uh, and I'm excited because he, like James said there, he's going to be playing from behind a lot with the Bears. He can catch it. He can run with it. He jinks around. He's exciting to he watch. Exciting. Um, so he's, he's going to be a good little addition, and I'm excited to see what he can do. Who you, who you fancying this week? Well, I'm struggling because I'm fifth on the, on the, on the wave wire because I did win my first round game, but we won't go into that. Um, so I'm kind of looking at a few people who I think might be taken off. I think Golladay was a great shout there, but I think someone near the top's going to take him. Buck Allen I do like as well with, uh, with um, Danny Woodhead out, I think. I think he had about 70 yards in the first game, carried the ball a lot as well, so that's a good option there with West as well, so I, I like that option, and my other shout is Conley, Chris Conley, he didn't have much in the first game, I think he had a couple of receptions, 40 odd yards, but I think people are going to latch on to Hill, I know it's going to be difficult to stop still, but I think he might be a good little second receiver they've got there, so maybe as a, as a flex kind of guy, I think it's going to be a good person to have around anyway. So lots of options. By the time this comes out, you'll have done your waiver wire picks. You'll have had your new uh, roster all sorted. So let us know who you've gone for in the comment section. Also, let us know which games you're excited about, which are the biggest matchups, and how your team is going to do. You know, we want the predictions. We also want your video reactions as well. So make sure you get involved with us. NFL underscore talk underscore UK on Twitter. Um, if you found this YouTube video, then you're already winning on YouTube. Just make sure you subscribe as well. That's about it for this week, isn't it? I think that is it, yeah. Let's keep the interactions going. I think it's been a good first week with uh, NFL Talk UK. So we're looking to just get as many people involved as possible. Let's keep watching some NFL. That's it, man. There's lots of football still left to play. Until next week, keep an eye on our Twitter because we've got a couple of surprises hopefully coming up. But we'll speak to you next week. Cheers.